Good evening. I'm Mayor Ron Nuremberg with Bear County Commissioner Justin Rodriguez, and we're joined tonight by Dr. Golare Aga, who is our San Antonio Metro Metropolitan Health Chief of Informatics, the Queen of Data. She's here to talk a little bit about what's in our progress and warning indicators. But first, our COVID-19 update for the San Antonio community. Tonight, we're reporting 151 new cases of COVID-19, which brings our cumulative total since the pandemic began to 64,767. After Several days last week of more than 200 cases, the seven-day moving average has moved up considerably to 192. Uh, one bright spot in the report tonight is, uh, is fortunately we do not have any new deaths to report this evening, but we knew many of our family members and community members are reeling, so please continue to keep them in, their, in your thoughts and your prayers. Over in our hospitals tonight, there are 248 patients in the hospital with COVID, which is up 11 from yesterday, also including uh, several increases over the last few days. That includes 20 new COVID-19 related admissions over the last 24 hours. We now have 91 patients in the ICU and 45 patients on ventilators. It's Monday and as we have always done, let's take a look at the status of our progress and warning, indica warning indicators that are guiding the decisions of our health professionals. The overall risk level has moved up now to moderate as two of our seven indicators are moving in the wrong direction. We've seen a rebound in the number of new cases, so our 14-day trend is now orange. And uh, unfortunately, the positivity rate has once again jumped up now to 6.9%, up from 5.8% last week. In addition, we still have more than 200 COVID-19 patients in the hospital and slight upticks in most of the hospital trends as well. So the overall risk level there is now moderate. The same is true uh, for the school indicator bar. Two of the three indicators are of the 14-day trend, excuse me, are the 14-day trend and the positivity rate. So our school risk level is now also in the moderate category and the guidance remains as it was last week. Uh, I do wanna take a moment to talk about Pre-K 4SA. Uh, yesterday, Pre-K 4SA announced that four staff members and one student at its East Education Center had tested positive for COVID-19. Center was closed and all East Education Center staff were tested yesterday. I am happy to report that all of those results uh, taken were negative. The test found no additional COVID-19 positive staff members. And I'm also told that the um, staff members who are positive are uh, doing well overall and we will continue to pray for their fast recovery. Today we are testing children and families in classrooms with a staff member who has been tested positive. We anticipate receiving those results tomorrow tomorrow and pre-k for SA will then work with Metro Health to make an informed decision on when it is safe for children and staff to return to in-person learning. So overall again uh, we are now seeing uh, the uh, stages of, a, of an increase in, in cases and hospitalizations. Uh, fortunately we are still on the front end hopefully uh, and we don't see this surge too much but we do have to take proper precautions and so let me issue that warning right now. Please do everything you can to make sure you follow the health guidance, wear your mask, physical distancing, all the things that the public health professionals have been telling us about. It is crucial to put those into place right now. So let me turn it over now to Commissioner Rodriguez. Great. Thank you, Mayor. And, and let me also join in um, underscoring, I think, that message, that warning really for our community that we've got to continue to be vigilant here. Um, you know, there are some, some numbers that are trending in the wrong direction. We need to make sure we get in front of that, ahead of that. I know I spoke with a friend of mine uh, who's a state rep in El Paso today. El Paso County is seeing a significant surge in cases. Um, they're, you know, at least partially attributing to that to folks being a little bit complacent. Uh, I know there's a tendency because of the last seven months to feel a little bit fatigued about the guidance we're getting from our public health professionals, but we have to continue to, to, to enforce that. Um, so I'll join uh, certainly the mayor in making sure that we are doing that. A um, couple quick updates from the county side. Uh, one, uh, we do have, we know that the, the service industry has been impacted significantly over the past six months. Um, we uh, last week voted on a $4 million restaurant and bar grant program. Those applications are currently available. Uh, it's a grant relief program administered in partnership with Lift Fund. Eligible restaurants and bars can uh, receive up to $25,000. Applications are open now and close at 5 p.m. 
on November 2nd. So that's Monday. You've got this week to get your applications in. Uh, please go to bearcountystrong.org or call 210-335-1777. Uh, the other thing I'll quickly update the community on is the election. Of course, this is the last week of early vote. Um, election day is next Tuesday, November 3rd. Uh, as of yesterday, through yesterday's numbers, we have already exceeded, Bear County has the total early vote of the 2016, which has historically been the highest turnout here in Bear County. So we've exceeded that number with still five days to go, including today. So we wanna remind folks to participate in democracy. We have about 1.175 million folks registered here in Bear County this year. Um, and if we include mail ballots, um, almost 500,000 have already uh, voted. So that's about 43% of the of the total that's come out already. Uh, but we've got a ways to go if we wanna break records here. So we wanna continue to have folks come out, participate, um, and keep in mind this week in particular, folks have till 10 p.m. This is the first time we've done this in Bear County history. Uh, normally we close them at eight, but we did this in part because uh, we, know, we know the essential workers, uh, those that are working back-to-back -back shifts, um, the nurses, the doctors, firefighters, police, um, often have a hard time getting to the polls. So we extended that uh, for two more hours. It's open to everybody. So Monday through Friday this week till 10 p.m., please cast your ballot and election day is November 3rd. Thank you, Brad. Great. Thank you, Commissioner. And uh, my thanks to you and your team over at the county for continuing to conduct a, a very well-run election, very safe. Uh, for those of you who haven't cast your, your vote yet, please do so. Uh, you have all this week for early voting again uh, and critical ballot, critical election. do want to make note, uh, again, many people are struggling out there. We want you to know that all right, certainly some numbers to watch because it seems like when it comes to COVID-19, things are moving in the wrong direction uh, at this point. We heard the mayor say today the positivity rate is back up to roughly 7%. It's at 6.9%, as well as the risk level for uh, San Antonio and Bear County. They take a look at that every single Monday. We have bumped up as far as the risk level goes from low to moderate. We now sit in the moderate range uh, as hospitalizations are up as well. And that also goes for schools as well. That has risen to moderate risk level as well. I know my daughter's school and some other schools are now entering into that second uh, semester where many kids decided to maybe other parents sending their kids back to school yeah. thinking that it was lower but uh, now more and more kids are going back there as that risk level continues to go up. New cases today, 151, bringing our total to 64,767. The good news, no new deaths to report tonight. So certainly plenty to watch. Uh, let's hope these trends curve back in the right direction. Let's take a look at the weather now. Sarah Spivey in for Adam Kasky today. And as far as temperatures go, a big change and some good news if you're waiting on fall, perhaps early. Winter. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, Myra. I would even argue it feels like winter out there. Skipping I mean, what fall. a. What a day to fill in for Adam. I get to talk about the colder weather our way. Let's take a look at some of those current temperatures right now. The map looks like a rainbow with all those temperature differences. It's 53 in San Antonio, but just within the last three hours, we've dropped 30 degrees. Uh, and it's in the 40s up in the hill country, 42 in Kerrville, 39 in Rock Springs. There's that front. A wider view here in the teens in the panhandle of Texas. So this is some real deal cold air. And on top of it, we're going to have a chance for some scattered scattered rain over the next two days, and that's because of an upper level low pressure system. It's not going to amount to much, but the scattered light rain and cloud cover is going to keep us really cool. In fact, tomorrow morning we'll wake up at 42 degrees. It'll be in the 30s in the hill country, but above freezing, and that's an important thing to note. A little bit closer to the neighborhood view around San Antonio, 42 at Stone Oak, 41 for the low in Leon Springs, 45 in Seguin, and 44 in New Braunfels. We won't warm up that much tomorrow because of the clouds and because of scattered light rain. And so because of that, our high temperature only going to be in the low 50s around San Antonio. It may not get out of the 40s uh, for uh, most folks up in the hill country. So looking at the day tomorrow again, cloudy with some areas of light rain and then we'll clear out on Wednesday. Still cool on Wednesday, but then we'll have sunshine through Halloween, chilly mornings, comfortable afternoons, Halloween evening, probably in the 60s. Nice and cool. Great for some uh, socially distant trick or treating, perhaps. Oh, there you go. <laughs> That's a Halloween week forecast. Thanks, Sarah. Also this weekend, the Aggies looking to continue their winning ways, Greg. Yeah, they're coming off a bye week, and in this case, they're getting a chance to get past the 
toughest part of their schedule and now have opportunities, as we call it, to lie ahead. When we come back, more about how Kellen Mond feels about where the Aggies are right now and what looking ahead as well against Arkansas. And UTSA sincere McCormick still the number one rusher in all of college football after his big time performance Saturday night coming up. After taking the week off, the Mike Texas Aggies are going to take their number one, number eight, should say, ranking out for a little spin when they host the Arkansas Razorbacks at Kyle Field on Halloween night. This is their first game back since beating Mississippi State in Starkfield for the first time since 2012. San Antonio's own Kellen Mon is off to a great star behind a much improved offensive line. He's completed 61.5% of his passes, thrown for nine touchdowns, only two interceptions, has the highest quarterback rating right now in the season, 144.9. Now with the toughest part of the Aggies schedule behind them with their only loss to Alabama, they have a chance to finish strong starting with the Razorbacks, but Mon isn't overlooking Arkansas's much improved defense. I definitely think they've been playing really well and, um, you know, I think it's one of those defenses that have been playing um, together as a full unit. Um, I think at times, you know, across the country you see, you know, a lot of big time players and then some guys, but um, you know, I think they play really well together and, you know, within the scheme they do and they execute really well, so um, it's definitely going to take a, a, a full game for us and a, a big time week of game planning to um, go in and, um, you know, play a big time game in the SEC. The Aggies are 11 and a half point favorites against the Razorbacks when they kick off 630 p.m. on Saturday night. Thanks to Longhorns pulled out a must win against Baylor this past weekend, even after they were up only 13 to three at the half after back to back losses and conference play to TCU and Oklahoma. Another Big 12 loss would have sealed the season and led to calls for Tom Herman to be immediately fired. As it turned out, quarterback Sam Ellinger rallied in the second half by scoring two rushing touchdowns to lead the Horns to a 27 16 win over the Bears to improve to three and two overall, two and two in the Big 12. Even though a lot of fans thought there was to be much more of a margin of victory against a team that hadn't played since October the 3rd due to the coronavirus. Now they have to face the undefeated and sixth-ranked Oklahoma State Cowboys Saturday in Stillwater. If we give them our best shot and we don't beat ourselves, much like we did not beat ourselves on Saturday against Baylor, then uh, we'll, we'll have a chance to, to get a big-time win. And, uh, but we know it's going to take uh, everybody playing uh, at the very top of their game because they're sitting on, at the top of our conference, and uh, we know that We've got our work cut out for us this Saturday. Another good sign for Longhorn fans. The players stay for the plane of the eyes of Texas after the win over Baylor. The UTSA Roadrunners ended their three-game losing streak by getting an important Conference USA victory at home Saturday night against Louisiana Tech. The victory improves UTSA to 4-3 and three overall in the season, and more importantly, 2-1 and one in conference play, which places them second in the West Division. But the Roadrunners had to come from behind in order to secure the 27-26 victory. In doing so, former Judson running back Sincere McCormick registered his fourth 100-yard game of the season with 165 yards in the day, three touchdowns as he continues to be the leading rusher in college football. And now the Conference USA offensive player of the week. But even more impressive is the fact he carried the ball a school record 37 times. So considering his workload on Saturday, how was he on Sunday? He's awesome. He was in my office the very next morning just laughing and, and just he's in great spirits and bouncing around here. You, it's unbelievable. The kid is mentally tough, physically tough. He loves San Antonio. He loves his university. He loves his teammates and that's just who Sincere McCormick is. All right, next up, the Roadrunners hit the road to take on Florida Atlantic Saturday at 11 a.m. 37 carries? That's huge. Got some wheels. Well, I wouldn't the next day. I would be in the couch just like, help me. He's young and full of energy. Yes, he is. Thanks, Greg. Our KSAT Q&A is up next. We are eight days away from Election Day in an incredibly unique year and certainly unique things happening in Bear County and across the country. So for today's KSAT Q&A, we want to bring in Dr. Henry Flores, Professor Emeritus of Political Science at St. Mary's University. Thank you so much for being here, Professor. Let's talk about with what's happening here in Bear County. We know that we've already broken a record. More people voting early at this point with eight days left to go than the entire early vote in 2016. What do you make of that? What are your impressions? Um, first of all, thank you for, for having me on your program. Um, it's really a reflection of what's going on across the country. Uh, something like 16, 62 million people have already cast their votes nationally. 
which is almost the entire total amount of votes that President Trump received in 2016 in the general election. So there's some excitement in the air. Um, I checked all the polling places in Bexar County. Every polling site has outvoted itself from 2016, just across the entire across the entire county. Um, it's a, it's just an energized election. I know both parties have been uh, getting has have very energetic get out the vote uh, operations going on. Uh, they're knocking on doors. Uh, and, and getting people to the polls as, as much as they possibly can, encouraging them all to early vote. And part of the problem with early voting, well, part of the reason for the early voting is, it seems to me, has been that voters are afraid their votes won't count, so they're trying to get them in as early as they possibly can. Uh, Mail-in voting is way over the top. Uh, something like 70, 75,000 ballots were, were, have been mailed into Bexar County, which is three times more than they had before. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, twice as many as they had before uh, in 2016. So they're really, uh, the voters are just coming out of the woodwork right now. And doctor, what does that indicate? I mean, obviously people have already made up their minds if that many of them are voting early. Historically speaking, does that tend to benefit the, the, the person who's already in office, like Mr. Trump, or does that benefit the, the challenger here? Where's the excitement coming from? Well, actually, this election, you know, according to all my colleagues, we've been all over the Internet for days now trying to figure out the answer to that particular question, along with some other ones. Traditionally, um, one of the things we've noticed over time is that early voting has increased every general election to date. This is the highest it's ever been. So this is just really the culmination of a trend that's been going on for a while. Um, part of it has to do with... Um, the flexibility of the early voting uh, uh, allows for voters just to have a lot of different options to get to the polls. It's easier, and they don't have to worry about scheduling all their time for one day to vote. So that's part of what's going on. The other, the other thing that's going on is that traditionally, um, uh, early voting used to be the purview of the Republican Party, and, and mail-in ballots used to be the purview of the Republican Party. They used to get that organized. Now that's being flipped, and the Democrats apparently seem to be turning in more ballots in the early voting process, uh, at least as far as mail-ins are concerned. That's the only way; we can, those are the only ones we can track, um, and uh, so that's changing as well. Um, what is going on? I don't know. All I have is a anecdotal information. I've seen interviews and heard interviews of voters around the country. Uh, some of them are saying they're desperate to vote. They want to make their vote count. Uh, they feel bad about not having voted in the last election. And so they really want to vote this time around. And so there's just a, a myriad array of, of re reasons for that. Most of which we probably won't know till the post-election surveys are conducted and we really get a look at the electorate as to why they cast their vote when they did. Yeah, we'll find out November 3rd or the days following, certainly. You talked about mail-in voting. I want to go back to that for a second. We know that mail-in voting has always been an option for those who qualify, but certainly this year it's a much bigger uh, priority for some people. But we have heard from people who said, I planned to mail-in vote, I even sent in my mail-in ballot, but now I want to vote in person. I've had a change of heart on my method of voting. What mm -hmm. happens in an instance like that? Well, as long as they don't cast them to send their mail-in ballot in, they, they're free to go to the polls to vote. But, you know, the only the only law says you can't vote twice, right? So you either mail in your ballot or just don't don't mail it in and just go to the polls and, and cast your ballot. So that's 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 an option. And then quickly, as we're wrapping up here, uh, lots of poll numbers out there suggesting that uh, former Vice President Biden is leading, but we saw 2016, those polls did not turn out to be very accurate in some cases. Your thoughts on the polls and where they stand right now? Yes, that's been a, a good item of discussion on the internet with, among political scientists as well. And it seems like um, that they've been trying, the, the polling, the, the traditional polling organization have been trying to make adjustments for that to try to minimize the amount of error. Now, the problem is with polls, anytime you have uh, trying to try to project a, a, a big population center like Bear County or Harris County or United States of America, and you're, and you're trying to project uh, an opinion from a small number, you're gonna have a lot of margin of error built into it. Now, we do know that the individuals that don't tell the truth or or sleepy voters uh, that, that choose not to answer surveys and so forth are, are extremely minimal. 
as far as mathematically is, uh, is concerned. So the poles are generally accurate, but you have to look down at the bottom in the fine print and look at the margin of error. So the margin of error says plus or minus 5%. You could be as much as, as, as 10% off easily on some of those polls. And so even though they, that a poll will say that, uh, uh, for instance, Vice President Biden has a 5% or a 3% lead in Texas, like I saw one of the national polls today, he could have as much as a 8% lead or or little as, or he could be behind in the polls. So there's a lot, there's a range that you have to think about when you look at polls. Take them with a grain of salt. Good day advice. by day, yeah, we're getting closer to finding out how this all will play out. Dr. Henry Flores, professor of political science at St. Mary's University, thanks for your time. Thank you. We'll be right back. The clock is ticking with Election Day right around the corner. Americans flocking to the polls. And as we've talked about, voter turnout starting breaking records. This is the two candidates hit key states in their final push with just over a week until the last votes are counted. ABC's Rena Roy now with the latest. In one of the most contentious and historic presidential elections in U.S. history, both candidates are pulling out all the stops, going head to head in key battleground states. It may come down to Pennsylvania. And I believe in you. I believe in my state. Eight days from now, we're going to win the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. President Trump in Pennsylvania today, where the hot button issue of fracking is especially important for voters, blasting former Vice President Joe Biden for his comments no, about ending the, the use of the fossil fuels at last week's presidential it, debate. He'd say, I'm against fracking. I will ban for he did this for over a year. Biden has since walked back his statements. I'm not banning fracking in Pennsylvania or anywhere else. And I can project protect Pennsylvania jobs, period. Meantime, the president again downplaying COVID-19. And we're rounding the turn. You know, all they want to talk about is COVID. By the way, on November 4th, you won't be hearing so much about it. COVID, COVID, COVID. Biden has repeatedly condemned the Trump administration's response to the pandemic. The bottom line is Donald Trump is the worst possible president, the worst possible person to try to lead us through this pandemic. As the two campaigns continue battling it out, long lines of voters have been spotted all over the country, with more than 61 million Americans already casting their ballots. I feel that it is our most fundamental right to vote. And voting numbers are so high, they're already exceeding the total for early voting in 2016. And there's still eight days to go before final votes are cast on Election Day. Rena Roy, ABC News, New York. All right, temperatures have dropped in San Antonio. So now we're wondering, of course, Sarah Spivey, how long is this really going to last? You know what? Honestly, it's going to last for a long time. Now, tomorrow is going to be our coldest day in a while here in San Antonio. But even into the weekend, we're going to have chilly mornings in the 40s and comfortable afternoons. So sweater weather has arrived and jacket weather has arrived for tomorrow. Right now outside, it is cloudy. Here's a look at the high temperature for the day, 84 degrees which is above average by five degrees. But then that cold front hit at around 230, 240 around downtown San Antonio, and that dropped our temperatures. We're currently at 53, so our low temperature is going to go down even more. By the way, we saw about five hundredths of an inch of rainfall from the light rain earlier today. Not much, but it's something. It's been a pretty dry October, but here's what everybody's talking about, the temperature differences around the area. Look at that, 41 in Kerrville, 39 in Rock Springs, 53 here in San Antonio. You can clearly see where the cold front is. It's still 82 degrees in Cachula. So we've got a really large spread of temperatures, about 40 degrees around the KSAT 12 viewing area. Of course, everybody across South Texas is going to get that cold front eventually, even uh, the uh, Rio Grande Valley down south of San Antonio. Winds are from the north gusting up to about 30 miles per hour. They'll continue to do that overnight and even into tomorrow. It's going to be pretty breezy as well. Uh, and so that'll continue to funnel in this cold, cold air. It is very cold up in the panhandle of Texas, 19 degrees in Amarillo, 25 in Lubbock. They even had some snow and some ice earlier today. Our rain chances here in San Antonio, 
Yeah, looking all right. We're not going to see a ton of rain, but we are going to have on and off again light rain over the next 36 hours or so, all because of this upper level low around Baja, California. That's going to continue to bring us that chance for rain. And it'll take you through the future cast, and you can see exactly what I mean. Very light rainfall in some places, maybe amounting up to a quarter of an inch of rain if you get a good downpour, but the rest of us probably going to keep temperatures uh, just on the low side with the on and off again light rainfall. Uh, that'll be the case uh, through about Wednesday morning, and then things will really clear out for us as that low moves off. It'll be sunny around San Antonio by Wednesday afternoon, but not necessarily warm, just sunny. Hurricane Zeta, late season hurricane, actually going to make landfall along the central and eastern Louisiana coast by Thursday, and that's actually going to pull in some dry air here and help it to be sunny around San Antonio. But we have to get through uh, this uh, cold and gray uh, chunk of weather over the next about 36 hours or so. So tonight we'll be already at 45 by midnight. It'll be windy. You may run into a light rain shower or two, but no widespread rain uh, late tonight. Again, winds will gust up to about 30 miles per hour. Waking up tomorrow, temperatures in the 30s in the hill country, but above freezing 37 to start off in Kerrville, 46 Uvalde, 48 in Crees of Springs, 48 in Gonzales, 42 New Braunfels, Seguin area, and 42 around San Antonio. The wind chill, though, is going to be a major factor tomorrow morning. So as you're heading out the door, make sure to have that scarf, that jacket, because with winds gusting up to 25 miles per hour, wind chill values will be in the 30s in some places, potentially in the 20s in the upper hill country. And then we're not going to warm up that much tomorrow again because we'll have scattered light rain, cloud cover all day and a northerly breeze. We'll probably only get up to about 52 degrees in San Antonio. Temperatures will stay in the 40s in the hill country, even only up to 50 out in Del Rio. And so then again, just a break down everything for you. It's going to be a cloudy and cool day. A better chance for that scattered light rain in the morning hours, uh, but even by the afternoon you may run into a light rain shower to north winds at 10 to 20 miles per hour. We'll clear out on Wednesday, and so we'll be able to get up into the 60s, but it's still going to be chilly over the next 48 hours. Then we'll wake up in the mornings uh, for the rest of the week in the 40s. Sunshine for the rest of the week, though, too, and that's nice. Halloween looks good. 74 degrees for the high temperature. Probably in the 60s around trick-or-treating time. Don't forget, you got to fall back on Sunday in the morning, uh, and it's going to be really nice forecast, very fall-like indeed. Might be time to consider turning that heater on for the first oh, time. Maybe. Yeah. Smell Probably. that awful smell. Right, exactly. <laughs> Burning off the dust. We'll be right back. Taking you live now to the Senate floor on Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C., where senators are gathered for the confirmation vote of Judge Amy Coney Barrett to become the next associate justice for the Supreme Court this evening. She is expected to be confirmed tonight. Uh, you can see that there are uh, a lot of masks being worn during this vote. And, of course, that is a requirement uh, for this event happening here this evening. Uh, you'll remember at that event where the president introduced her as his nominee, uh, that was deemed later a super spreader event. A lot of people uh, with both the president and his inner circle uh, deemed to have contracted COVID from that event. We'll keep an eye on what's happening here on the Senate floor. But again, Judge Amy Coney Barrett expected to be confirmed uh, with a Senate vote this evening. Thanks for watching the news at six. Have a good night. We'll see you at 10.